Hello, I'm Owen McNamee and I'm here today on behalf of the Irish Cultural Centre in Hammersmith, London. As part of its remit, the ICC provides a platform for Irish authors to launch, promote and discuss their work. While the ICC enjoys showcasing established authors, it's also very keen to encourage and support new and emerging Irish writers. To do this, the ICC lays with established authors, creative writing courses, literary agents and publishing houses to produce it on this online series which features an established author, me, introducing and interviewing a debut author. For this fourth interview in this series, I'm delighted to be speaking to Una Mannion about her debut novel, Crooked Tree, which was published by Faber in January this year in hardback, Una, and it's just come out in paperback, yes. hasn't it? Um, that's good, I can, I can see you now. It's a strange sensation here for two people who know each other very well to be interviewing each other, talking to each other across, um, across a, a Zoom link. Um, I, there's a lot of starting points in it, but let's just kind of start with the the impulse to write. Where did that come from? Where uh, in you're you're born, brought up in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. So young Una in Philadelphia. <laughs> was was it always there? Did you always? No, I don't. I don't think so. And I I wish I could say that that oh I I always wanted to write from when I was a child or that there was this like you know particular perspective I had as a child, but I don't think that's exactly the case. Um, I, I was a reader, but we, I grew up in a house that was quite strict and we didn't have television um, ever. And so I suppose we, we read as much as we could. Um, but when I went to college, really, I went to study biology and I ended up um, taking an English, you had to take an English class and from the first English class that was that was me. Um, you know, I just kind of discovered something that I really loved. And I went to college in the South in Tennessee. And so we read a lot of Southern authors. So, you know, I was reading like Flannery O'Connor and Faulkner and some of the agrarian writers, um, you know, Andrew Lytle and just this whole kind of uh, world opened up for me. And I, I suppose I was living on a mountain that was quite isolated and with, um, you know, people who like Andrew Lytle lived uh, it, where near where and people like Robert Penn Warren were visiting and you know, so there was this kind of environment. And, and then when I moved to Sligo, um, I came to, I've been coming to Sligo all my life, but when I moved as, as uh, you know, a, a young, an older teenager, I guess I was 19 when I first came and I kind of encountered Dermot Healy and, and Force 10 had just started to kind of, um, Evolved. Just tell, just tell me about, about those days. I mean, I, I landed in Sligo when you were 19, so I probably landed there about sort of 10, 12 years after you did. But, you know, that there was a, I mean, a, there was an extraordinary ferment, Dermot, Liam Bardwell, a lot of visual artists as well. I mean, it, it was, um, there was a lot in it that was destructive, but there was a, an incredible force in it as well, very sort of creative force. I, I actually, it's, it was such an, an extraordinary time because I suppose it was a time when everyone was leaving. You know, everyone I knew, with, like people I met would be like, they were just home from London, but they were going back because it was a time of, you know, em, emigration, late, late 80s, uh, early 90s. And, and yet there was just this incredible scene. Um, and I, I think um, the Sligo Community Arts Group was going at the time. So there was this, there was all this uh, energy being put into like street festival and and there was writers and people like were coming into Sligo that never left like Molly McCluskey and Jean Valentine and with Leland Bardwell they started um, they started a literary festival um, Scribe and so you people you know international writers coming into Sligo and and Dermot was I suppose kind of in the center of that had started. Um, he was running writers groups out of the unemployment center um, up on high street. And they were like group writing and doing classes. And there was this, yeah, there was this great energy. And I kind of got, I didn't know anyone and I was incredibly lonely. And, and you know, in Sligo, like living, I was living here in a hostel and like I found this group of people and I just kind of got involved from that point. And, I think working with Dermot was the first time that I really thought about the writing because I got to do uh, spoken word interviews with people. And then when you would go back with the, you know, the hand, like literally we didn't use tape recorders 
we transcribed this was, this was for force 10 this was for force 10 a legendary periodical magazine yeah. for journal so we yeah. we would we would be writing down and then you'd go home and you'd start to um begin to think about how to how to craft that a bit more where to place things in the interview so that you know that there was a kind of um I suppose an edit that I was editing the interviews and that was my first real sense of like the impact of changing the, you know putting words here and and moving I mean there was somebody else's words you know the, in the interview but I think I kind of got really interested at that point but I didn't write until I was in my late 40s um you know and so I studied literature I taught um I worked on different magazines and journals, um, but I didn't, I suppose, didn't get over something in myself that was, I suppose, self-doubting or just not um, able to commit. Yeah, I think you, still, you, still, you, still, you kind of still have yes. that. Uh, is that, I mean, is, is, is that part of the drive? Uh, you know, because you, you, you are, I mean, although, you, you never appear to be a quite a driven person. I mean, you come back to the first 10 days, or there's a story about you that you 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 worked you worked so hard in first 10 that sort of somebody came in the morning, you were asleep under the desk <laughs> and, and the office. I don't know if that's true or not, but <laughs> um I do I think there's like a work ethic and a tenacity, maybe so that that you know, I know I know that I probably tend to be a bit self-effacing or insecure in a in my public persona. But I think maybe underneath that, there's a lot of like grit, like in terms of work ethic, and and I I think with Force Ten, I, I I suppose I always do have this thing of not wanting to let other people down, and you know to give a hundred percent always. But I think um, it's only in the last few years I've been trying to give that I suppose to myself a little bit, or to the, a, a project that I'm working on as opposed to somebody else's project. And that's a kind of tricky, it's hard to do that. I've taught for 30 years and I suppose the students are in front of you and you always see them. And it's hard um, not to give everything there when when they're when yeah. they're right there in front of you every every day, expectant and eager and so. you do you did an MA and goal, didn't you? I mean, um... I, I suppose, I mean, maybe that kind of gave you a, a structure, but when was the first moment, when was the first time you, you could, you, you got that, well, for me, the resonance back off the words that, you know, as in the Heaney line to you, to when you set the darkness echoing, when, when, when did, I mean, it's, it's, it's more than, can I do this? It's, it's something more, it's he, hearing something back, I think. When, when, when was that? Or was it... um, I, th I think the first time I went to write something, um, I, I do think I, you know, and as, as messy and, and dreadful as it was in some respects, you know, just a first draft of something, I think there were times when I was writing where I became not conscious, you know, that I was writing, where I was just writing and, and sometimes the way the words fell or the image, maybe I, I kind of felt like I hit I hit a chord of something for me personally, you know, where I felt like that, that actually um, does more or it reaches in some way. Um, and, you know, I, I'm very careful. I don't want to, I think you have to earn reach those reaches or you have to, you, know, you need a lot of detail and just um, being in the world before you make that, that reach for something more. Um, but I felt maybe that, um, in, in those early stories I was trying to write, which were often quite autobiographical. Um, and this was, um, I'd started in a writing group and I was, and we were all, we had, we each submitted, you know, every few weeks I had to have a story. Um, and I, I think in those moments I was starting to think, well, maybe I, I could, um, I could try this. And I had a, uh, I wrote a poem, um, Crouched Burial, um, that, was something that came really quickly um to, and it, it ended up winning the Hennessy prize but that that piece was written about a, a child's body that was discovered in our family field in Colleen Moore in, in Strand Hill and I think there was just something about that um you know I look at it now and I think oh there was, I would, there was so much I would change about it now 
but at the time I just it, I wrote it and it felt like it wrote itself and I do think maybe I got something about a mother's loss um, or a mother's inability to let go of a body and yeah. of a child of her child and um that that I I feel like I felt like I'd hit something maybe in, in that. Yeah, it would just explain a little bit more. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful poem. It's, it's like a prize, prize winning poem um, about just the, the, the circumstance of the, the child's body is 2,000 years old. Yeah. To, um, so, yeah, 50, like um, it's, it's an Iron Age body, um, like 150 BC. Um, so they were they did a, um, an archaeological dig in our field in Colleen Moore in 1980. It, it was in 1980 and 1981, and they were just looking to look, at, there's an oyster mid in there, and they were expecting just to look at like what evidence of like cooking and what kind of animal bones would they find. And they found this child's body with a, with a brass earring and a, a blue glass bead placed next to the rib. And it was in a, what they call a crouched burial. So kind of in a fetal position on its side. And they know by the teeth buds that um, the child was 18 months old. And middens were more like, um, I suppose they were almost like um, places to dispose of shells. You know, this, people were nomadic and they were harvesting shellfish in the winters and they would live near the shoreline. Um, but burials were unusual. And so it was just kind of extraordinary, like it was in our field and like they, the archaeologists were all there with the, like tiny little brushes brushing and and the, the shape began to come out of the earth and I, I was 15 um that summer and it was just kind of it haunted me like it was always I always think about that child which I sent I tend to say she but I mean, we don't know the gender um and I think that um I just went when I went to write about it maybe because it had been there for so long it just it it just came out. It's funny. It struck me, uh, you know, it, it it kind of resonates with some of you know Heaney's um, bog body poems, and um, that it, it it's an intensely Irish piece of work, <laughs> and yet a crooked tree is such an intensely <laughs> American piece of work. I mean, it, could you kind of tell me something about that? I mean, you know, are there two parts of it? Is, is, is it just Poetry in, in, in our does it work? The more lyric you get, yeah, I, does it work in the Irish landscape? I, I think I think there's definitely an element of that, um, and I haven't really thought about that. That the poetry tends to to, to be here um, a little bit more than than the prose the, the prose um, in America. But I think you know I think I've lived in Ireland. You know I've been here for thirty years now, and and coming all my life. And part of the draw of here has always been like people's relationship to the landscape and relationship to place. And I grew up in a, you know, in a world where like everyone moves all the time. There's so much migration, but, you know, and you come back to Ireland and like all my family would be in the one place. My aunt and uncle, a brother and sister lived in the same house. My aunt reared her kids there and it never changed. And so when, in, while everything was very, kind of volatile and always changing in my house in America and the house was never the same or it was really gone to me. I left home when I was 15. So it was there was no home place. But in Ireland there was this place and everyone had stories of, you know, for every, you know, square acre, you know, square meter of land, there was like a story or a name or something. And I I was really as if all my life I've been really drawn. That I find that very compelling that relationship and so I think there's that has been hugely influential in my life and maybe part of my wanting to be a writer um and in, in a funny way I always think that the southern my southern experience is very connected to my Irish experience because there's a similarity in, in that like the, the how central story is in both cultures um you know, it's Southerners like are really colorful storytellers and, you know, you never let like the truth get in the way of a good story or, you know, like this. And, but there's also a kind of, um, you know, there's a, a, a difficult past in the South, um, but, but there's also um, a real sense of land and things that you don't get so much in the North, but I'm a Northerner. I mean, I grew up in Philadelphia and, and 
uh, even the book I'm writing now is set in the Northeast um, between Philadelphia and Vermont. So like it's, um, when I- The book, the book is, it, it, it's, it's full of longing, I think. And then there's a, it's part of that longing for home or longing for place. I, I think that, I think the longing in, in the book has a lot to do with the father. And, and I guess, you know, my own, I suppose in the one thing I did draw on a lot is, is my, my own father, who was an Irish Im immigrant, and he, he was someone who never settled in America, um, came back, came back to Ireland a few times to try to live here. And, and I guess what happened to him is he's just one of those people that, that was never at home, could never find home again. And as a very young child, I saw that. I saw that in my father when I was, I already saw that something in him was broken or lost. And I think that grief for him was a huge, not just my childhood, but all my siblings. I think we all felt that about him. My father never owned a house in America, moved a lot, lived in a lot of different places and, um, and just, and always longed for here um, but when he was here, was not at home here anymore. And, and you know, so that I always thought I'll never do that to myself. <laughs> you know, so the, I mean, it, it, it is a, a kind of emerging theme in sort of an Irish American writing as, as the absent father, the man of that generation, I think. Um, it did, you know, and, and I would, I would say where I'm sitting down in West Lago. Where they regard New York as being the next door parish, but they think Dublin is a foreign yes. city because so many of them emigrated. But yet those people come home and 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 they're not of this place anymore. Yeah. You know, it's kind of it's, it's, it, you know, I was I was thinking, you know, kind of in, in, in true um tell us a, a, a little bit about about the book. Um I've, one of the questions I hate is somebody says, Tell you, tell me what your book's about. Yes. I kind of go, I wouldn't have spent two years and eighty thousand words. <laughs> you know, kind of writing it, if I knew what it was about, if I could sum it up in, in, in a sentence, but just tell us a little about it. Yeah, so the, the book is set um, outside Philadelphia um, in in a place called Valley Forge. Um, and it focuses, you know, it's a family of five kids who are the children of an Irish immigrant, but the father um, was estranged from the family and then died, had gone up to New York to do to do work, you know, to get to get work and and had died. So he's He's predeceased in the book, but I suppose throughout the book, the father's um, is it, presence is there because because the children are grieving him, and and I suppose their connect their connection to nature and their connection to each other has a lot has come through through the father. But the book opens um there the five kids and the mom are driving home. It's the last day of of school before the summer holidays and they're fighting as, as you do. And the mother's getting frustrated and she pulls in on into the verge and she puts the 12 year old, the 12 year old child, the daughter out on the road and, and speeds off. And I suppose the kids look back and the narrator who's an older sister, the 15, a 15 year old sister looks back and with the kind of already knowing something dreadful will happen, it's dusk. And she doesn't make it home. Um, I mean, she does eventually, but not not in a straightforward way. And that becomes, I suppose, the catalyst for the events of the of the book. Um, it sounds like I realized that it sounds like a thriller, like you know, this child that disappears. And but I I never ever thought that I was writing uh, anything like genre or like a thriller. Or, I mean, I always thought I was writing. Um, I suppose a coming of age story about the summer of 1981 and a family that's um, spinning apart. And um, and a, a, the narrator who's desperately trying to hold a family together, you know, and they're already, they're already broken apart. And so it's kind of the story of that summer um, when, and I, and I suppose for me, I also think it's a really interesting time, like 19, 81, you know, Reagan had just been elected. That whole kind of, um, I don't know, I feel like in America, all that, um, those preceding decades of, of aspiration towards some like, like liberal, like some kind of liberal ideology was, was gone. Um, 
you know, Margaret Thatcher just been elected in, in the UK, maybe in 79, I think. And there was just a whole different, um, a whole different kind of world coming into play. And I, I, and so where they're, where the family is located on Valley Forge Mountain to the West is this, this really um, kind of, um, it's undeveloped still and it's prayer, you know, it's meadow and prairie and there's all this industrialization and there's um, a nuclear power plant being built at the foot of the mountain where they live and the super malls, you know, it's the King of Prussia mall where some of the scenes are set for a brief period of time in the early 80s was the biggest shopping mall in the world and there's just a different you know and so she's kind of caught between that as well she she want I suppose she doesn't like change or she wants things to stay how they are the idea of, of three mile island yes. and uh, the mountains and I mean reference point for me in, in a way I mean it, it, it's more a sort of a, a, a drifting sense of things and in a way would be maybe um, stand by me or um uh, I think you mentioned Stranger Things yourself, and even there's a little bit of the ice storm in it. There's that kind of kind of uh, suburban sort of sort of sexual hijinks kind of going on behind those doors as well. You know? um, but what really struck me about it, and maybe this goes back to 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 um, Crouch Burial, there's a really strong lyric sense of of nature in it, of and of children among nature. I think. Yeah, I. It's what it's for. Um... From the very beginning, and it's something I I actually took out at, in the end, I took out of the book, but each chapter had a tree. I don't know why, I just, not I, because it's not really a structural device, but I don't know why I felt like it grounded me a little bit. So I had, um, I'd done, and Valley Forge Mountain is kind of amazing for the, for the trees, and, and because it's a, it's part of, half of it is a national park, and it's protected, so you have this like, the suburbs in a way but it's also in this incredibly beautiful place and so I'd gotten um just reports of the all the trees that are on the mountain like the, the national park reports on like pdfs and downloaded them and just started to like look at all the different trees and kind of folklore and medicinal uses of the tree and what's happening to those trees and I I don't know but I suppose one of the things I grew up in Pennsylvania, you know, which is named for the forests, like it, and like in, you know, I grew up landscaping with my father and like in the autumn we would, you know, we'd have the, the leaf clean up and like you'd be wading to your waist in leaves and, and in Ireland, we don't really, you don't get that. You don't have that incredible, like just like in the autumn that, that leaf fall. And I think I probably miss trees. <laughs> I miss you a beautiful image, uh, a, a kind of sinister image of which tree was it starts to poison its neighbors. Um, oh, it's the it's the um, the black walnut. The, the, the black walnut, yeah, yeah and, and the, 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 you relate it to the young man and the, um, the, the bad boy whose name kind of escapes me in, in, in the book, but it, it, it's beautifully written. The, the idea of this, this tree poisoning everything around it is kind of seeping into the you know, seeping into the, into the earth. Yeah, I just, I'd read um, the, um, is it The Hidden Life of Trees? The Hidden Life of Trees, or The Secret Life, The Hidden Life of Trees. Um, but that book, yeah. you know, came out way later than, than the, when the novel is set. And I kept thinking, I'd love to be able to talk about some of, like just the, the ways in which trees are actually communities and how they function and su support what, you know, support one another and keep, you know, young trees keep, trees alive, stumps alive for, you know, hundreds of years. And, you know, it's incredible. But I think when I was writing about the, the, the nature, I think it was in a way for the, how the children connected um, to their father and, and to their, to, so maybe the, you know, the ghost of the father is sort of there all the time. And um, in a way- to yeah, It's funny, we talk, you talked about structure there as well, you know, um, you know, you said about the, the, the um, Ellen is gets thrown out, of, thrown out of the car um, by her mother and is there a kind of sense of the sort of thing that you didn't intend to be an almost inciting incident for the book but the publishers pick it up and run with it because it's a hook they can hang the book on you know and say right th this is what happened and you know it's on the blurb and yeah I, I kind of um I didn't mean it it becomes the, I, I suppose it is the catalyst event in some ways but it but I think the decision to start there was just I had to start somewhere and I decided to start with 
that moment. Um, and I do think it's like the cover of the American book is very noir. You know, it looks um, it looks like a thriller, and the, it, it came out with Harper Collins in the states. And and I noticed like in every review that that in opening scene is what seems to be mentioned, but it wasn't really. Um, I suppose. It, it's not what the, it's not what the book is. I don't think to to, to me, you know, it's, it's, you know. I agree. There's no, there's, there's no you know, kind of mystery or crime to be solved at the end of it. It's, 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 it's the book's resolved, if you like, but it's not solved. Yeah, yeah. In some way. So I I think I I do think um it's mis not misleading um some that the kind of focus on that scene um but. You know, it, it is what it is, but I, I noticed like in even in Goodreads, some people will be like, I thought I was reading a thriller. This isn't a thriller. I don't. Do you, do you I mean, I, I remember saying to you when the book came out and just for, for the audience, we and know each other for well, maybe kind of well for about four years. Um, uh, you started a, 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 a writing BA in, in, in the IT Institute of Technology in Sligo. And I met Una one day in the supermarket. And we see Una Mannion coming through you towards you with a pleasant <laughs> smile, but a determined look on her face in the supermarket. You know, I don't say turn and run the other way, but you know, you're you're getting a job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but 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 we I mean we 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 work together in, in in through all of that, you know. So um so that that that's and and we we've kind of soldiered in sort of many, many places. Although oddly, I can kind of realize that this morning that. I've never been in your house. I've never met your husband. Um, although apparently your son did tell you one day that, um, you know, who is this guy? Why does he keep ringing? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but um, I can't remember where, 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 where I started all that. Just to, to, to explain how how we uh, how we know each other so well. Um, but again, you know, if there's that drive. Just bring it to to, to the IT and and a very successful BA that that. Uh, you know, just just to say, I mean, your 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 students love you. I mean, and 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 they love you just for for your 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 warmth and, and integrity. Um, you know that that you can basically a lot of them would be students who they're they're the first people in the family to go to college. Um, and that kind of strength that you provided for them is 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 what they need. You know, and they need that kind of integrity and sort of somebody to trust. And they've, they've done extraordinarily well, haven't they? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, I like I would have received a hundred times more than I've given like from students over the, I, and I've been teaching in IT cycle for like 20 some years and the course is now four, been running for four years. And I think you, you know this as well, like um, like the students, they are first generation, um, it, our demographic is different than like at some of the universities. Um, but we just have we have like amazing students, and I think, I mean, we were so lucky to have you. I, you know, I we still mourn the day you went to Trinity, but but um, I think what's what has been like. I also sometimes don't think I would have ever written if I hadn't had students, and part of part of that. Um, it, I think being a teacher and having students is something that it single-handedly gave me self-belief. Um, I, even though I still find it hard to go into a classroom and I still have my stomach flip-flop, you know, at the start of a term or whatever, and how's the class going to go? But I think students are so generous, um, and it is, and the students we have here have, and particularly on the writing and literature course. That it did bolster something in me, you know, about to to do this. How, how, how does that work? How, how does that bolster your your self belief, if you like, or, or your confidence to write? I, I, how, how I just work? think I just think that um, that like when when students when you know that the class is working or that students that you have students, you know, in a particular moment in a class or looking at a piece of writing or whatever it is that. That yeah, I, I think that sometimes you do have something interesting to say, or that you can hold people, or you can hold a community together. And for me personally, that was like really um, 
it, it just boosted my confidence in, in a way that I can never explain, except that it, I felt good about myself. And teaching has made me feel good about my, even though it's made me feel dreadful about myself. Some days you come out of a room and you feel exhausted or depleted and think you failed them. But in the bigger picture, generally, I think it's given me a, a sense of who I am even. And I think as well, even working with people, like I always, I'm always quoting you, like, because you get to be in other, you get to see other people with students and talking about writing. Like, so some of the things that you would say, like, if you look, if you listen to a place long enough, it will start to speak to you. I remember you saying that one of the first days that you met with them. And I always think about that in terms of place, just keep listening and, and it'll start, you know, to, you'll start to yeah, hear yeah. it. I often wonder why you brought it on yourself to a certain extent. I mean, I, mean, I, I rang you the other day about, about something and, um, it was like 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning and you've been up since five o'clock writing. And while I was talking to you, you were directing building work at your house. You know? <laughs> yeah. But what's, what's the impulse to start a writing course? You know, because I mean, your life is full, you know. Um, I, I think it was, um, I've been working in IT for about uh, 20 some years. And I began to think about like, what would I really love for, what would I love for myself? To, to be honest, I should be state that it wasn't just like a selfless thing. Like, what would I love to be teaching and what would I love to be doing? Um, and also like, what would, what Slago really needs? And I always thought like, there were so many, um, we had started a writing group here and there were so many people who wanted to write, um, but there was no outlet here. In, like they had to go to Galway or to Dublin. There was nothing online at the time. And so like, there was, you, if you had circumstances where you couldn't travel, you know, you couldn't do that. And then there was this incredible legacy of writing in Sligo. There was like you and Dermot and Jean Valentine and Leland and Brian Layden and all these people and all the writers that have been attracted to Sligo. And, but there was no reflection of that in, in the college. And it, like the support was incredible. Like when we started the course, so like immediately the, um, Sago Central Library contacted us and now we run this series called The Word which you're, you're very you have been a huge part of um, and so every month we have a visiting author I mean this year alone we've had um, everyone from Claire Keegan to you know Sinead Gleason to, you know we've it's been so um, you are our very first word you were the you and Louise Kennedy right. were the very first the very first right, yeah, word definitely. I just because I just found the poster and I look back now and, and you know, 40, 40 some, 50 some writers later, you know, because sometimes we had two writers every month. It's incredible, like that the, the, the library um, wanted to do that with us and that, you know, we've had that, um, we've had, we've brought that to Sligo. And so I think there's like a lot of, you know, you and I edit the Cormorant together and there's things that have happened because of the course um, or because, that, because there's a, there's uh, an atmosphere and there's a people are, are interested in writing and um, there's an energy well, around. You know, it was, it was there a sense, I mean, you know, the energy that was inside when I moved there, when, when you first moved, I mean, that completely dissipated. Uh, we, we lost Leland, we lost Dermot, we, we lost the, 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 the writing festival. Um, and there was, there was an emptiness in the town, I think, which has only just started really to, to and, and in the area, which has started to fill again, I think. It's a, yeah, I, I was thinking um, Sligo, that, like, it's going to be like promotional video for Sligo, but like come west. For you as a writer, what, what, is, what does Sligo mean? You're, in a way, I, I, in many ways, whereas I, I embraced it when, when Dermot and Leland were about, and that almost, um, what was it? They, 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 Dermot, uh, Pat McCabe talked about Dermot's writing and said that, was it the world stained glass uh, gleaming in the eye of a dog? <laughs> and you know, but it has to be the stained glass and yeah, the dog. Yeah. And the way that sometimes Sligo was, it's too much stained glass, you know, it's too much yates, it's too much, you know, it's the tea towel of, of, of yeah. <laughs> you know, we, 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 I kind of feel like you and other people have put the dog back into yes. it. <laughs> 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 you know, I'll take that. That's, uh, <laughs> I um, think, the, I, I do think, um, I don't think I would have ever written if I didn't live in Sligo. And part of that has to do with like people like you and and Molly McCluskey and, you know, a, a generation that kind of came after Dermot. I think there's a, 
there's a really vibrant writing culture in in the north in this part of Ireland and but also there's something about Ireland in general about about writing and the respect for writing and for place so I'm not like I do think for me um what you know why I, I'm not you know and I'm finding it difficult to write in Sligo at the moment I'm going to Tennessee for a month <laughs> to try and finish my book I'm, I'm going up to the down to the mountains in Tennessee um for four weeks by myself which will be like a to, I, I think just to separate and try to um, get space. Um, but I do think Sligo is a great place to write. Um, at the moment, I'm just slightly overcommitted. And as you mentioned, building works in the house and no kitchen. And just kind of like... tell, me, tell me something. When you go from, I mean, I remember when I published my first book, uh, there's, a, there's a period of kind of elation and then you, there's, there's a kind of flat period. And, and somebody said to me, you're like, you're like a dog chase, chase chasing the car, what's he going to do when he catches it? You know, you, when you catch the car, the thing that you want. Um, what, when you had, you know, when, and that elation of getting a book accepted and getting an agent and getting publishers and, and how did it feel different to your expectation when you were in the kind of book being published and, and, and now, I suppose? Um, I, I actually, um, so that, that whole thing of getting the agent was, was kind of, I mean, and I was with you that the weekend before we'd taken the students away to the Doolin Writers Weekend. Do you remember? And I sent the manuscript yeah. right before we got on the bus. And when we came back at the end of the weekend, um, the um, I, I, I had a letter from my agent to, to say that that he wanted to talk, that he loved the book, and um, to, uh, to to and that he wanted to sign me. And that I. The euphoria, like I can still, like I, I just was on top of the world, and I don't, and and I think when when Faber bought the book as well, I think after that, um, the publishing part, and as you said, the thing that you always want, and then and then it's there, and by the time the the book, it's a, it was a two year loop really, and I think at that point I was in the next book in my head, and so there was a little bit of a not. And I and also because of COVID and because we were in lockdown, there was I was by myself the night of the launch to get Wi-Fi. I had to go and sit by myself in a room, it, it, you know, in the middle of nowhere. So my family weren't with me. I was by myself, like, you know, saying yay. <laughs> now it was so lovely <laughs> because people came from all over, you know, my, from the states and from England and Ireland, and we were virtually together. But um. But there was also kind of a, a little bit of a sense of loss. You know, I, I don't want to complain because it was really great. And I'm so grateful to, um, that everyone came and made it. But yeah, you know, you put the earth, you mean, you know, it, it is a loss. You earn those things. You know, you work hard for them. You know, so you spend a lot of time in a room on your own. To, 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 to hopefully get to be in a room with other people, which hasn't happened yet. Yeah, you don't want to be carried shoulder high through the streets of Sago, but yeah. you know, get a launch, you get, you know, with the blue raincoats or something like that would, yeah. would have been would have been nice. But it's but it's you know, I think um as well is that I'm probably um it I have not found it that easy to sort of talk talk about the book or promote the book or um to engage in that um discourse around the book is hard you know I love having conversations like this but you know what I mean like the marketing thing I'm just not going to be able to really do that and and that's um, so there are times where I'm a little bit like oh should I I should share this on social media because someone has gone to such great effort and I, I need to share it and then there's a little bit of me that's like thinks are people, people think this is you know like that um shameless self-promoting or something so you know it's kind of we're all thrust into something that's not always comfortable and you have to find your way through it and keep your integrity intact and uh yeah well it's, it's i mean that get reticence i think is, is, is understandable um you know it's, it's like that almost like you you've done it now explain what you've done and and the thing you know it it it, it it's contradictory, really, isn't it? Um, and I, I find this at the end of that, what they would probably call a promotional cycle, because then you start to find the sentences that you can use about the book, and uh, if you like, the, a depth to what, I don't know if you're finding that now, you know, it's a kind of, the less people ask you, the more you think of, if I'd said it that way, I would have been happy with that. Is that 
because I do think there is something very raw initially and it's very emotional. And I know just because I have a few friends that had just published books and the, the emotions were very high, um, you know, um, because, because it, is, it is a huge thing um, to put a book out in the world and, and make yourself vulnerable to, to, the, to the readers and to reviewers. And I, I think sort of people, you know, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't like people who complain about, you know, being right or how hard it is, you know, but, but people live with things yeah. in life which are much, much harder. But there is a, a possibility that people don't raise just how vulnerable you make yourself. Um, and you know, kind of fair criticism is okay, but you know, so, sometimes it, you know, it, 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 it comes at you the other way, and it's the same every time. You know, you don't build up any scar tissue on it, really. Yeah. Um, but you, you don't have to worry about that. Every review I saw was you know, was, was was brilliant. You know, so, um, but the the new book, do you want to? If you don't want to say anything about it, uh, don't. Um, yeah, I, I, so the new, the new book is set in the states, and um, it, it's I'm, I I suppose I'm just ending the, the manuscript, um, first draft of the manuscript. So it's, um, it has a few drafts to go, but um, it is, um, in it, you know, it's, I, I, I suppose I'm, I'm worried about talking about it too much only to not kill it in some way, you know. Okay, that don't, don't, if you don't, yeah, that's okay. But, it's, that's right, but, yeah. but it, one of the things I've been doing a lot around it is, is a lot about memory and how we remember and how we forget. And that's been really interesting. So, you know, it's kind of taken up my time for the last few years, um, the reading around it. And um, so, yeah, that's. Where do you mean, do you start with that sort of, uh architecture of, of, of research I'd, and wait. yeah I think I do, I do a lot of re I, I would have done even for the a crooked tree like when I was saying like I really would have I mean in so much of it just gets lost because you can't have these big chunks of like you know what happened at Three Mile Island or you know these uh the Manson murders or you know the Manson's death list and all these things but I was reading an awful lot about it um and 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 weirdly, because Manson, um, or that time in the seventies, coming into the eighties, I'm sure there were seri there were serial killers before that, but there seems to have been, you know, there's this new interest in the psychology of the serial killer. I was watched Mind Mind Hunter recently, but that that um, it seemed that there had was such a there was a kind of violence in the seventies, you know, and that that growing up at that time is kind of it was always there in the background like the son of sam or the mansons or jim jones you know creating that cult and everyone drinking the kool-aid and those were the these images that when you know when i would see newspapers that's what i saw um and that that, that was so i was reading an awful lot about that but in the book that i'm doing at the moment i suppose looking at um I kind of had the, the kernel of an idea, but I probably did a lot of research around it first. And I was really interested in the idea of, of the Tempest and Prospero and Miranda on that island. And he's in charge of her narrative of what she can remember. And I love that idea that someone could lay down false memories, um, that that some, someone can um, change your past or, or shape how you remember. And, um, so I that that kind of preoccupied me, and I started reading an awful lot around that. Um, you're just a final question, and because I think we're we're, um, we're 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 beginning to end here. You, I think, regard yourself as an American writer more than an Irish writer, even an American person more than an Irish person. Is that? Yeah, I I think um, I feel like wherever I go, they're like, but you're not, <laughs> you're not us, you know. <laughs> so, so, so yeah. Some of them would claim me, um, but I think I do think that my that I am American in so many ways in my in my sensibility. I grew up there. All my brothers and sisters. I'm one of eight kids. All my siblings are there, um, and I spent all my formative years there. And even though I came to Ireland and spent summers here growing up, um, I and this is home. I do. This is home. Like in so many ways. Like I like Sligo has been this like touchstone in my life, all, all of my life. Um, and there is a kind of at home this year that I don't get anywhere else. No, no doubt about it, but I'm still, um, 
I, I think I'm an American and and I'm more comfortable, I think, looking or looking or unlayering things that are American than I am. And maybe it's like the vantage point of being away. Um, and so that yearning that you were talking about earlier, I, I think there's a, you know, I have a sense of loss, you know, of course, because like I, um, I miss home, you know, that home, but, um, and it doesn't exist, you know, obviously, but I, I miss it anyway. And, and so I think it's easier from here to, to look at things American and, um, and maybe I am a little bit worried that if I looked at things Irish people, like, who does she think she is? Like, she's not from here. You know? <laughs> you know, it's like, but I, it just hasn't, I mean, sometimes like the poem and the Crouch Burial, or there's something to an Irish, but for the most, and I've written a few stories that, I, that, but they always seem to straddle being Irish and American. They're, they're often yeah. about that, that hybrid sense of self or that splintered sense of self. Um, Ireland is a, a harder place to write about than, than you think. I mean, Steve Calvin, the thriller writer from Belfast, a uh, very nice man uh, and, and very, very successful. But all his, his illegal thrillers are set in New York. He's never been to New York. He's never even been to America. You couldn't do that with Ireland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You wouldn't get away with it, yeah. Uh, no, no. So uh, well, since the, the, the Tempest came up, um, thus our revels now have ended. Um, Una, uh, I mean, you are hugely admired by your students, you hugely admired by your fellow writers and your, your circle of writers around you in, in, in Sligo, uh, despite self-doubt. <laughs> um, so thank you for, for being Thanks. here. Thank, thank you so much, Owen. Thank you.